For over the past 60 years, Arizona PBS has told incredible stories of Arizona's distinctive people, beautiful landscapes, and treasured history. Now relive those memories we've pulled from the vault. Hello, I'm Alberto Rios, revealing the stories behind Arizona's Hispanics who put their lives on the line to serve in combat during World War II. They were known as the Hispanic Flyboys. And the civil rights fight makes its way into the 48th state. From the Vault presents another edition of Arizona Stories. The year 1964. The location, the state capitol. The issue, a public accommodations bill. Well, you were denied those rights to go into a public place of public accommodation, into a restaurant, into a hotel, into a drugstore, sit down and have a, a soda like anybody else. Diabetes stole Clovis Campbell's eyesight in recent years, but the state's first black senator vividly remembers the protest of March 30th, 1964. Campbell was a member of the House of Representatives. You had a bunch of young people who uh, held far bent on making sure that the message got across. We wanted the public accommodation bill. Unfortunately, the police started to come down and want to arrest people because they started blocking off entrances to the uh, state bill. Brooks was president of a local chapter of the NAACP. He and Vice President Lincoln Ragsdale Sr. coordinated the protest. These pictures belong to the Ragsdale family. We made a conscious decision to confront the Senate, particularly where Senator Giss of Yuma was stonewalling on the public accommodations bill. The bill would force businesses to end decades of discrimination toward African Americans. I traveled with white Presbyterian preachers, all of whom were young, and, um, and we could not eat at restaurant. I remember one evening we went into a restaurant and we sat and we sat. And obviously these young white men did not understand. And finally I, I said, we are not going to be served. The protest could have erupted into more of an emotional confrontation. But police treated protesters gently, using blankets to carry people out of the Capitol. Governor Paul Fennin wanted no violence. Paul Fennin had very poor understanding of how a class of people in this, in these United States could be, uh, could feel, be left out. Um, Paul understanding that, that what we give them should be enough for them. And, and we, we don't kick them around. We don't do anything with them or for them. Brooks vividly recalls an encounter with an aspiring attorney who vehemently opposed the bill. A young man came out and accosted me as leader of that group and, um, and to say that public accommodation was not necessary and, and gave, giving all of his legal reasons why we ought not to have it and, and the reason why we ought to be still. And that young man was Mr. Rehnquist. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Get in. Lawmakers eventually passed the Public Accommodations Bill, but after Congress approved the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I welcome the protest because it did do some things. It did make some people stand up and listen, even though uh, it took a while to get it passed. For those who participated, such as Clay Kavnis, the protest was a validation of sorts. Here was this backwater, which was very conservative, uh, which was untouchable by outside currents. We were very much behind the times, and here we were just participating in the energy of the times. It was not supposed to, to be expressed here, and, and it was, so it was, it was very gratifying. For Reverend George Brooks, the protests set the stage for later civil rights victories. We've come a, a, a long way, but so has society. Society in the, and the whole has gone much further than we as a class of people have gone.
Ah, oh, what, what an outstanding display. It just makes you feel magnificent. They were finely crafted in silver and copper with an odd collection of images of cactus together with mermaids. Elegant gifts from people who lived in the desert to a seafaring marvel that would bear their state's name. USS Arizona. And it was used when dignitaries came on board when they had the changing of command ceremonies. And on some special occasions, they brought out the Arizona Miner. A 41-inch bronze, another gift from the people of Arizona and its mining companies. But as storm clouds approached in late 1940, the Navy refitted the Arizona for war. Finer things like the silver and the statue were removed. And after that, the miner became a mystery. It was lost. Nobody could find it. Such stories about the Arizona fascinated Lorraine Hayslip. I've always had a love of history. For 11 years now, she's been collecting memories from men who served on the Arizona. She's already filled one large album. Right now, I have enough material that I think we could do another, another three books at least. I've studied this so much. I feel like I've been floating over the ship and living part of it. She feels like she's come to know these sailors, even those she's never met. This McClafferty, I read the deck logs and I see his name so much, I says, what did you do now? I even talked to them while I'm reading the deck log and I says, what have you done now to get in trouble? Some families have shown Lorraine letters written by sailors on the Arizona. Sunday morning, good morning, my darlings. I just finished reading over all of your letters, honey. And, and I, I believe, believe I can, I can realize, realize better realize now better how hard it is on you than I could before. Your letters have changed a whole lot. It was a lonely sailor named Gene Corey writing to his wife and baby back in the States. The way things look at present in Japan, I don't know when I will see you. There are other letters from men on the Arizona stored away in the collections of the State Capitol Museum. Personal photos also have been donated. Glimpses of life on the ship dating back to its early years. August 5th, 1923. I'm having the time of my life. I suppose Mother has told you I'm aboard the best ship in the Pacific Fleet, the USS Arizona. Their pride was uh, beyond belief, and I believe it was even more on the Arizona than any, because this is what I've heard. We're laying about one mile off Seattle in the harbor. We leave the, harbor. The, the year that letter was written, in 1923, the Arizona docked in Tacoma, Washington, and a five-year-old boy came aboard on a tour. Well, that's just so, so large. Lorraine's future husband. It seemed like he could see forever, see one end to the other, you know. Charles could see all the way into his future. In 1935, he would enlist in the Navy, and before long, he got to serve on the Arizona. And when we went, we went aboard there, I'm telling you, it was just a thrill. Thrill of my life. For new sailors, there were rites of passage. They have a real ritual on there, I'm telling you. These guys, they were all covered with black grease. And they come up and smear you with grease and everything. And they beat the hell out of us. <laughs> and they'd have boxing matches, wrestling matches. And <laughs> you had wrestling marines and everything else, you know. No way, I didn't want a part of that. Softball teams, they had baseball teams, they had football teams, and stuff like this. They needed a little fun to break up the monotony of their work. May 6th, 1941. There really isn't very much to write about because we do the same thing day in and day out. Learn how to swab and sweep and scrub and all that sort of stuff. Now, scrubbing the deck wasn't so simple. It was a tightly choreographed art. And go back and forth. And then the boatswain made holler, switch. And we'd move to another one. <laughs> I can see all this. I've heard the stories of how they swabbed the deck, how they twisted the mop so that when it came down, and he showed me that it just fans itself out. Lorraine learned all this, not just from living with Charles. Long before she married him, she fell in love with another former sailor from the Arizona. Lorraine was married to Ed Marks for 39 years until he passed away.
Darling, I believe I'm going crazy. While I was sitting here yesterday, I wrote this little poem. And of course, it is dedicated to you. Now, as historian for the USS Arizona Reunion Association, Lorraine is still discovering little bits of history of the ship, like Gene Corey's poem to his wife. Irma, the rolling sea whispers when I try to go to sleep. So I stay awake to listen, to see if they bring messages from the deep. I mean, it was, and it still is, very emotional. Honey, I must close for tonight as it has grown late. So I will dream of you and baby, your ever-loving husband, Gene. Gene Corey was riding from the USS Arizona in Pearl Harbor, December 1st, 1941, his last letter. This is why I do what I do. And the more I do it, the more I want to do it. Much of what Lorraine does is like detective work, sifting through piles of documents, tracking lost pieces of the ship's history, and sometimes the tedious months of following a paper trail finally lead her to the right person. And he says, and by the way, I think we've got something else here that might come from the ship. And I says, oh, and he says, yeah, it's a statue of a miner, and I about fell through the floor. People have been looking for that for years. When the statue was taken off the ship before the war, it was crated and stored, but a confusing label made it hard to find. Now, the Arizona miner is back in his home state at the Capitol Museum. To see it after everybody had been looking for this for so long, I think that's great. The gifts once given to a battleship, reminders of the place it was named for, have come back to Arizona, and now they help us to remember. But to remember more than just what happened at Pearl Harbor. It's a sad situation, and we can't forget them. But just to be, for the Arizona to be remembered for that, uh, I don't think they would want that. It should be remembered for what she did. She served her country for 25 years. She sailed this high seas and showing her power, her pride. The feeling that you see when you see these pictures of the ship as she's flying through those waters, you know, it just, I still feel proud. Alongside old Route 66, on the outskirts of Williams, stands a monument to a man and his mountain, Bill Williams. Known as Old Solitaire, Williams was Arizona's most colorful mountain man, a prolific fur trapper, renowned good shot, and legendary trader. He roamed the mountains of northern Arizona and much of the west for over two decades. Old Solitaire was killed by Indians in 1849, Soon after, a fellow frontiersman named a 9,000-foot peak after him, and the nearby town of Williams followed suit. There was no more dangerous a job during World War II than flying bombing missions over enemy territory. 185 Arizona Hispanics served as pilots, co-pilots, bombardiers, gunners, and radio operators. One such pilot was Mesa resident Gilbert Orantia. Orantia flew 50 missions in B-25s in 1942, then returned stateside to become a combat flight instructor. Orantia was born in 1917 in Clarkdale and graduated from Clarkdale High School in 1936. He attended what was then known as Arizona State Teachers College in Tempe for two years. Oratia met all the requirements to become a pilot and was undergoing psychological testing when the doctor asked him about his nationality. You're a Mexican, aren't you? Yes, I am. He said, well, you're going to have a hard time. Well, my reply to that was very simply, look, if I have passed all, all the examinations, you put your signature on that piece of paper and I'll take my chances with the best you got. And if I can't cut the mustard, I don't deserve to be a pilot. He says, well, if that's the way you want it, I said, that's the only way I want it. Horatia rose to the rank of second lieutenant. His first mission was in Northern Africa as a co-pilot. 
As we're going over the field and all this flock is bursting around us and we're jumping all over the sky, I look over to the left and the hip uh, ship and it was uh, one of my buddies that we had been just all the way through together and they blew that ship apart. But you know they all got out? They all got out. At 86, Orantia is still able to climb into the cockpit of a restored B-25 at Mesa's commemorative Air Force Museum. You had to learn, learn these by heart. They'd blindfold you and you'd say, well, this is the compass and this is, the, you know, this is the flight indicator. You'd have to touch it and tell them what it was. One of Orantia's most harrowing experiences came on a low altitude bombing mission. His job was to fly 200 feet above the ocean and skip bombs on the water, like a stone, into an enemy ship. I remember we were so low that my tail gunner would say, Lieutenant, dip the tail and I'll get us some fish for lunch or for supper. During that mission, enemy fire tore into his aircraft, blowing away part of its tail. Took the co-pilot and myself, all our strength to move that and hold it there. So we're holding it and we get to a, an airfield that was a little, uh, English airfield called Bone. So we landed there. Pretty soon here comes the British in the Jeep and they look up at the look up at the rudder and it's all blown to heck. So we had we already had gotten down and looked at it. And they went around the plane and looked at it and they said, Blimey, how'd you blokes get that aircraft on the ground? I said, Well, don't know, but there it is. There were other frightening moments for Orantia during his fifty missions like a belly landing when his front nose gear would not deploy, or the time his plane's windshield was shattered. After the war, Orantia worked as a community activist and a professor of foreign languages at Mesa Community College. It's been over 50 years since the Hispanic flyboys of World War II took to the skies. But like those for whom they fought, the flyboys will not soon forget it. It was a wonderful experience. I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world, and I loved flying them. I didn't particularly care for people shooting at me and stuff, but that comes with the territory. It is a harsh and unforgiving land, but for generations the Apaches of San Carlos have called this desert their home. Forced by the government to settle here over a century ago, they've had to struggle to survive and struggle to preserve their culture, which gradually disappeared due to the influences and intervention of a non-Indian world. White people have told our ancestors, you know, don't use your own language, you know, you can't pray and dance, you know, like the, the way you do. I just believe that these white people thought that our language was uh, strange to them and they were afraid of it. Or if we danced or put paints on our face, you know, meaning symbolizing something, that they were afraid of it. You know, they didn't even like our long hair, so they cut our hair. We were raised speaking English as our first language. And my grandmother told me that it doesn't, the world is changing and your life is changing, so your first language is going to be English. So we learn, I learned English, and um, that's my first language now. And, um, but when I, um, and then I never knew anything about my tradition because I was taught that that was bad for me, my, my culture was bad for me. As with many native peoples, some of the most significant impacts in the San Carlos Apaches were made by the religious ministries that came to the reservation. Father Gino Piccoli is the pastor at St. Charles Catholic Church in San Carlos. Like the Franciscan friars before him, he attends to the spiritual needs of his congregation. But unlike his predecessors, Father Piccoli is committed to helping restore and nurture the Apache culture by incorporating it into the fabric of parish life. We meant well, but we goofed. And we said, uh, leave, your, leave your Apache culture and spirituality and become like us European Catholics or American Catholics. And so I said, 
I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do everything I can to say what is beautiful about your spirituality and your culture, and whatever is beautiful is of God. From the outside, St. Charles resembles many of the old mission churches scattered throughout the Southwest. But inside, it's clearly a house of worship meant for Native Americans. Where at one time the traditional anglicized images of Jesus and Mary were prominent, they're now Apache representations. The baptismal font is a familiar component of Apache life, a watering tank for livestock. And within the ritual of the Mass itself, Father Piccoli has incorporated many of the same elements found in traditional Apache ceremonies. Paul, in one of his letters, he says, when I was with the Jews, I was a Jew. When I was with the Greeks, I was a Greek. When I was with the Romans, I was a Roman. It's good. It's good for the people here. It makes you feel strong, you know. It makes you feel closer to, to God. To me, it does. In addition to efforts within the church, the parish school is also very much involved in keeping the Apache traditions alive in San Carlos. This is in sharp contrast to the government practice a century earlier of sending Native American children away from home to be educated in the ways of white society. There were a number of parents who during that boarding school era, uh, they lost their tradition and culture. And so what they hoped for their children were, was that they would be able to get a good education but not off the reservation. Building on a solid academic foundation, St. Charles School offers a unique curriculum integrating Apache language and traditions, helping to restore an important part of Apache life before it disappears. One of the things that we try to emphasize here is trying to uh, keep the culture and the language alive. There's a whole generation for whom lang the language was lost. They came back on the reservation. They didn't know their ways. Today we're realizing that that was a big mistake and that culture is transferred through language primarily. And so we have worked very hard to put an Apache curriculum into the school that incorporates language, cultural opportunities, traditional ways, and traditional history. Developed over a number of years, the curriculum has become increasingly popular even with the youngest students who come to school eager to learn the vanishing language of their people. One thing I ask them from the beginning of the year is, what do you expect to learn? What do you want to learn in kindergarten? I want to learn how to speak Apache. I want to learn how to write Apache. One of the things that we've, uh, we're very proud of and we feel we've been very successful with is our after-school program. And for the girls, it means designing and, and actually making their own camp dress, their own jewelry, and all of the things that, that we associate with the Apache people. For the boys, it's learning their traditional sacred dances through what we call the gons, or more commonly known as the crown dancers. And it's a wonderful experience. What we have discovered through the culture clubs and the Apache uh, curriculum is that our children um, have a better self-esteem, they have a better sense of themselves. If you don't know anything about your culture, you're lost. And that's one of the things I love about St. Charles is that uh, it emphasizes Apache culture. What I hope, you know, is that in time, by, by using Apache uh, spirituality, by using Apache language, that what we do here in church, what we do in school, is going to allow these people to have pride in themselves, to believe in a future. It's a good reason to help people here. Isaac, Benah.